Brett, how are you, my man? What's going I'm on? Doing well. Doing well. How are you? Good. Appreciate the early morning grind of the uh, 7 a.m. wake up for a podcast. I get a casual 10 a.m. start and you have the 7. Sorry. That's all right. Happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. I'm, we've had some great discussions kind of off the air, but I'm super excited to have you on as someone who, you know, obviously the community looks up to you and you have a lot of success across the years. But something I'm very passionate about in our crazy time of gymnastics we're living in is making sure that we highlight people who are, you know, great examples of, of positive role models in the sport and who are doing things really well and are able to kind of create, you know, what people would term successful, you know, high level successful athletes at a, at a high level, but also one in a point of view that has the health in mind and the well-being of the athlete long term. So was uh, definitely jumping at the chance to get you on here and pick your brain and steal all your secrets if you're okay with that. No secrets, no secrets. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's totally good. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of really interesting topics that I think we can provide a lot of value with either between, you know, your experience as coaching, but also, you know, my experience is maybe being able to kind of see the bigger landscape of the sport. And the first thing is just let's give people a small context around kind of your background as a coach and where you got to where you are now so people can kind of frame this conversation up. Uh, yeah, I started, uh, back in the college days coaching at, uh, international gymnastics camp, um, which was an awesome start for me. Uh, cause they, you know, they go through and they teach a lot of the basic spotting techniques. They start you out and, um, and, you know, they try to just help you help you from the, from the very beginner levels as a coach. Um, you know, and it was, you, you learned how to have fun in the gym. And mm. I, th I think that, that definitely, um, you know, it, it got my passion started for the the coaching side of gymnastics. Um, and then when I got out of college, I've been coaching ever since, um, you know, so uh, 06, um, you know, been a full-time coach since then. And it's been, a, a, you know, a, an interesting journey around and through and, uh, you know, everything. Um, but uh, I've just been um, out in Seattle area in Auburn at uh, Ascend Gymnastics. Yep, I see it. It. Ascend, yeah, Ascend, yep, Ascend Gymnastics um, came out here in uh, September, um, and uh, you know I'm just starting the starting the new grind and the new journey and uh, trying to trying to have a have a little fun. But uh, we're working on uh, you know some culture stuff and um, you know it's kind of some reteaching some some gymnastics and retooling some things and and trying to build on some of the success that uh, this program has had in the past. And um, yeah, just excited about it. Yeah. And it's something that I've always, you know, there's, I have no greater respect for coaches who not only are able to kind of have that open mind about how to constantly kind of fine tune their culture and improve their culture, but also are able to get that high level progression for, for athletes that want it, right? Like I think you and I know there's some athletes that are in the sport just because they love it. They have zero interest in competing, but you and I and other people have worked with athletes who are like, nope, division one scholarship. That's my goal. I'm going for it hardcore. And I think the, the ability to understand what it takes from a cultural point of view but also from like a human level development point of view and a technical point of view altogether that's it's really challenging as a coach to, to kind of nail all three of those things together so um what, what do you think i guess starting off are maybe the biggest things if you look back on your career or you look across the landscape of our gymnastics culture now are there things that pop out to you immediately like oh man i made these mistakes when i was younger and i wish people could could learn this earlier that i didn't repeat that mistake are there things that are really glaringly obvious to you <laughs> loaded question um yeah I, I i don't know um i guess there's a there's a there's a lot of di different directions uh to go there um sure. you know i think number one is uh you know i mean you got to just look at everything from the foundational perspective understanding that if we don't build a good base that we're not going to get the higher tiers and um if we set kids up for uh constant frustration um, you know, through our, uh, you know, lack of instruction or whatever that may be, um, you know, it's a recipe for disaster in a lot of fronts because the kids are frustrated, the, the coaches are frustrated, the parents are frustrated, um, you know, and, and you're just not in a positive place there. Um, and so, um, you know, I'll jump into a concept that, um, you know, we talked about before, but uh, something that we talk about a lot, uh, you know, in, in parent meetings and, and, and those kind of things um, so that everybody, you know, with the kids as well, um, with with other coaches in the program is is understanding that um, we call it a technical ceiling. OK, um, and the concept behind that is, is that this technical ceiling kind of sets the maximum skill level that you're going to be able to create um, w with a certain level of technique that has been taught. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, every kid walks into the gym and their potential is at a hundred percent. 
right? You know, that whatever whatever their individual potential is, you know, you're sitting there and you're maxing out at 100%. And then everything that we teach them throughout the years um, affects that ability to then maximize that percentage. Um, and so, uh, you know, like if, if, if we have this kid and we teach this beautiful, technically excellent handstand, you know, and then we teach this beautifully excellent, excellent technical uh, cartwheel round off, um, we, we teach a really solid back handspring, you know, the, this kid then has a nice base to move forward on um, and to build off of for your double backs, your double folds, your two and a half triples, your, you know, your full ends, whatever it is, right? Um, but if we get that kid in and, you know, and we don't teach them very good uh, technical foundation, um, you know, ev every mistake that we allow them to learn throughout the years and we continue to build on those mistakes and that shaky foundation um basically it takes that technical ceiling and it drops it just a little bit yep. you know and every, every mistake that we teach them and every every uh bad habit that we ingrain in them it continues to drop that that technical ceiling um which basically you know it it, it doesn't it that that's their new max right um mm. that's that's their new maximum level that that kid can reach and it's um you know, there's the, the the famous saying of if you don't have time to teach it right, when will you have time to teach it? Again? And so if we don't take the time in the beginning um, phases to, to teach things really well and really technically, then we end up with this lower technical ceiling, um, you know, and, and the kids pay the price, unfortunately. And we do, too, as coaches, um, you know, because we have to go through the same frustrations. But you know, um, when it comes to us coaches, you know, there's another kid next door, uh, you know, and there's another kid that comes into the gym and there's, and, and we keep having these opportunities to like restart, you know, yeah. and like, oh, well, I'll do it better next time. And that's great. You know, that's great. C continue to get better and do better next time. But like, we just mess that kid up. Right. Mm -hmm. And we just, we just, we just dropped her ceiling or his ceiling. Um, you know, and I think maybe that's the big, biggest thing in the responsibility that we share um, is, is that, if, if we let them, you know, if, if we, if we, if we continually drop that ceiling, you know, and it's not intentional, I'm not saying it's intentional, but, um, you know, uh, we, we set the kid up for unfortunate, you know, frustration and failure and, and, and that's a big responsibility. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. And I think it's, it's really easy for us to see looking back on those maybe things that we let slide as, as how much of a profound impact it may have on the, the athletes and the coaches, you know, and the parents, everybody's mental and emotional well-being. It's frustrating when you have all these maybe like small technical hiccups that you didn't you didn't really correct and, and stay on top of. But also, we know that, you know, from the medical literature, that's a very easy way to increase the risk of overuse injuries is not being technically sound. And then as you alluded to, you're going to have really large performance declines when you do that. And I think people inherently know that that's really important to have really good foundation of basics and work those things every day. But in my mind, there's kind of three things that pop up into me that I hear a lot about from coaches who are concerned about this or want to know more is one is they feel as though they don't know how to get the right uh, drills or education. They feel as though the internet is a firing hose of information and they can't really sift through the weeds. And then also I feel as though a lot of them say, well, I would like to do this, but the athletes don't want to you know, be dedicated towards perfect basics and doing the work that's needed in the gym to be <clears> not wearing the handstand circuit, right? And the third one is, you know, the time and the planning nature of it is like, how do I fit all of this in into into a practice time and that kind of stuff. So I know there's three different ways we could zigzag with this conversation now. But I'm curious to hear about maybe your thoughts on on those three things is like the, how do you find quality information? How do you actually get the athletes to actually care enough to do really good basics? And then how do you actually fit it into your, your daily schedule? Uh, number one, I guess mentorship, right. Is, um, try to find, try to find some mentors, try to find someone that can help you, um, you know, uh, kind of go through the process. Um, somebody that you can ask questions to and, and, and get feedback that you really trust. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, there are, there are a million drills out there. Um, you know, and there's some really great, um, you know, places to follow and there's some great information. There's some great tools. Um, but if you don't necessarily know how to implement those into your system, um, you know, what you, what you don't want to do is you don't want to, you don't want to continually, um, you know, grab everything you see and immediately implement it all. And then a week later, you know, you see something else and you go, Oh my God, oh, I got to do that. And then you, yeah. you, you implement that and you forget about the stuff that you did a week ago or two weeks ago. And then there's no consistency to what you're doing. Um, you know, so, um, 
I think that's I think that's number one is is try to find try to find someone that that can help you through the process. Um, you know whether it's locally or it's um, far away or it's uh, you know somebody you can FaceTime with or somebody you can just call every once in a while or wh whatever it happens to be. Um, you know, if it's a subscription service, I don't know. I mean, uh, maybe there's some really great options out there. Uh, you know, there's there's a whole bunch of things on, you know, Instagram that you can follow for free. Addison yeah. Gymnastics is a great, great place to find some <laughs> yeah, um, um, But uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, and, and then the next phase of that is is just because you see a drill and you think it's good. It doesn't mean it fits in with what your athletes need right now. You right. know, and so it, it's kind of hard to keep those all backlogged and kind of in their space and whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I guess the biggest thing is, is the more you understand with a technical focus, mm. what it takes to do certain things and the progressional steps and the, the quality technique overall that you're trying to achieve, um, you have a better chance of then figuring out what individual drills you want to use right and so you don't need 30 you know uh you do three or four drills for certain things and and most kids are going to kind of get the idea with those three or four and you're going to be able to verbally talk them through and maybe adjust some things you're going to get some pretty good product from it and then there's a couple kids that you find you know hey these three or four drills are just not working so now i have to get creative and so you take yeah. a step back and you you look at <clears throat> okay, my 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 little drill circuit's not hitting this kid. She doesn't get it. So mm. so what do I do next? You know, I either call somebody up and ask them a question. Um, you know, uh, you you go and you you look for drills specific to that problem, or you just get creative yourself and you you know you you sit back for a minute. You know, you quiet quiet your brain down instead of thinking how frustrated you are that the kid can't get it. You get curious and you go, okay, well. Um, she's having trouble pushing off of her second hand. Um, okay, so what do I need to do for that? You know, what drill can I do? I put her against the wall and push off the second hand. I mean, whatever it is, right? Um, you know, and that that's kind of a, a benign example, but like, um, you know, uh, just attack it from the idea of, you know, you wanna try to solve a problem. You don't just want to, to, to throw drills in the mix and just hope that it naturally solves, right? right. Um, yeah, and I think you, I think you just answered the third part of the question, which is how do you have more time as well? You don't do 30 drills that you hope work. You pick three or four that you really know are going to be effective towards what you need. And something that I've learned from uh, Nick Ruddick that I really value a lot is like, how do you know what drills are going to work if you don't understand like the key points of performance of a round off, or you don't understand the phases of a round off that have to go really, really well. You're just kind of throwing drills against the wall and hope something works. If you can't say, okay, here's the hurdle position I'm looking for. Here's the side cartwheel hints that I'm looking for. Here's the shape <laughs> on the I'm looking for. And I think if people invested more time on mastering what the ideal they're looking for is, and then they found three or four drills to help, it would really make their life quite a bit easier on the other side. So I don't know. Do you agree with that? Do you not agree with that? No, a hundred percent. Absolutely. And, and, uh, you know, I mean, uh, there's a, there's a, a bunch of ways to spin a cat, right? So like mm -hmm. it's, um, uh, there's not a, a perfect technique per se, um, that we all, that we all can agree on. There right. are certain fundamental things that make skills work. Right. Yeah. And then, but you know, you look at a round off and you go, uh, people are teaching it, you know, with the, the cross arms and people are teaching it with the other arms and people yeah. are teaching it to the ears. People are teaching it down. People are teaching it with a lean. People are teaching it for, perfectly vertical. And so, you know, and I, and I think almost any of those can work, mm. but you have to have a reason why you're doing it. You have to have a fundamental understanding of like why you are choosing that method. And mm. then you've got to sell out for it you've got to commit to it and you've got to make sure you drill those things properly so that you get the result you want. Right. And if you don't, and if you don't know, maybe that's when you, you reach out to some people that have had some high, high success and, 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 and good things going and you, and you build off of, you know, uh, Hey, what do you like and why? Right. Mm. You know, maybe it's not just, what do you like, but why do you like that? What is the reason? What is the purpose behind that position? Um, you know, what, do you think you thought that was better balance or you thought it was better kick or you thought it was better turnover or like what, and how does that affect and how does that, how does that play in, you know, because all of these things are so complex that, you know, I mean, if, if you don't get the true understanding of like, why are you doing that? 
um, mm. then it's going to be hard to recreate and it's going to be hard to, it's going to be hard to kind of keep open. Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely want to <clears> return back to that like reason for why you're doing something. Cause I think that opens a more of a philosophical question down the road, but let's button up this question with the next <clears> logical question of the emails we might get or DMS, which is like, okay, I get it. But none of my kids want to put in the work to do that. Or nobody really wants to do a 30 minute boring handstand and shaping basics. What are your maybe pieces of advice to younger coaches who feel as though the, the uh, reception of that from athletes is maybe not all the way there to, to really just hammer those basics and do that boring work. They just want to do skills. They just want to throw new stuff. No, oh, I, I wish I could say I was perfect at it and, you know, and follow my lead, uh, you know, but I can't say that, you know, I, I mean, I have as much frustration at times um, as, as I'm sure every other coach does of, you know, of kids that just don't seem as motivated, um, you know, and, and I guess uh, I wasn't necessarily going to go into this side of things yet, but, um, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, you know, results based uh, or uh, process based um, things in the gym um, is, I have to take I have to take 100% responsibility for anything that's going wrong, right? And then I want to share the success with everybody else. So as a program, we should share share the successes of kids that are really happy and doing well and and motivated and um, you know getting new skills and 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 all of those things. Um, but if there's an unmotivated group of athletes, then I have to take that on myself. I have to take 100% responsibility for that, and I have to say how do I affect that? Right. How do I create something better than that? How do I get a kid that's not motivated to be motivated? Um, you know, and, and what is my part to play in that? You know, because if you, if you look at it and you just think, well, you know, they're not motivated, so I can't get anything I want. You, you know, you throw your hands up in the air and you, you give up on it. And that's not really, you know, that's not a productive solution either. So, um, if you take a hundred percent responsibility, even though you don't own a hundred percent, right. I mean, that's impossible. You can't own a hundred percent of the process, but if you take it on and you say, I own a hundred percent of the process, I own a hundred percent of the responsibility for making sure that this gets better. Then you may, you know, you, you start to try to implement things, you know, you start to say, well, okay, I need to, I'm going to put in, uh, two more, um, fun games to play in the middle of this, you know, mm -hmm. just to kind of give them some, some joy, right. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, I'm going to put up a joke a day or I'm going to, you know, and, and it and it's just what what little pieces can you put in play that might help move that enjoyment of what they're doing forward? Because somebody that enjoys what they're doing is going to is going to be more motivated, right. um, you know, and that goes back to the technical ceiling problem. Right. Is if you move kids too fast and they get frustrated because of inconsistency or they get frustrated because of constant injury or they get frustrated because they can never please you but we set them up for failure they can't please us because we didn't teach them good enough fundamental basics to be mm -hmm. able to please us you know how can everybody be happy in that situation and when you're not happy you're not as motivated it's just that's that's the way of the world right i mean mm -hmm. we 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 put the most of ourselves into things we enjoy. Right. And so we have to try to create some sort of enjoyment in what they're doing. And, and, and you can't all, you can't do that, you know, if we fail along the way, um, yeah. you know, tech technically or, or whatever else. And then, and then I guess the last point I'll make on, on that side of things, um, you know, is kids generally, um, they find important what you find important. And so if we make certain things really important in our gym and we focus on those and we, um, we celebrate them and we compliment and, you know, and, and we do all these things uh, to reinforce certain behaviors, then those behaviors become stronger because that's what, that's what we're rewarding. And right. so if we reward a, a perfect handstand shape more than we reward doing a back tuck, right? Then those kids buy into the perfect handstand shape and mm -hmm. they buy into the strength circuit. Um, you know, and sometimes, you know, sometimes to get a strength circuit working, you know, for, for a group that's maybe not strong, um, you know, and I just did this recently is, uh, you know, a, a group of kids that's a little bit weaker, you know, throwing some extra conditioning at them. They don't enjoy it and they don't love it. But then they figure out 
a, a month and a half, two months down the line, then all of a sudden their skills are getting a little bit easier. Right. And then you, and then you keep coming back to that and you go, I know you guys don't love that. I know that's not your favorite thing to do, but do you see the value? Do you see the rewards you're getting? Right? So we have to double down on this. We have to commit to this and we have to keep going on this because it is currently working. You yeah. know, all of a sudden the legs are getting straighter on casts and all of a sudden you're making a few more handstands and all of a sudden you're getting off the floor a little bit more. And so, um, it's challenging because it takes time and it's not the most enjoyable, but again, if we celebrate those successes, you know, and we go crazy over the 10 leg lifts, like, Oh my God, you did 10 leg lifts. That's amazing. <laughs> like they get excited about doing 10 leg lifts. Right. And it's, and so, and that, you know, and that's kind of the whole thing about, you know, don't use conditioning as punishment and doing th those things because you make it into a negative. It's not a negative. It's a chance to get stronger and a chance right. to get stronger is a chance to be more successful over time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many like really, really important things you said in there. One is like, it's impressive your level of accountability and your, your willingness to take ownership. But also as you, as you kind of said, in, uh, maybe didn't even know it, but even just be humble about like, oh, well, you know, I've, I'm still making mistakes and I have things to learn. And someone who has a lot of experience like you, I think a lot of coaches, unfortunately, kind of become complacent in this like, oh, this is what we're doing. We're always going to do this, the same thing. This is this like, you know, take it or leave it. And they don't really have that sense of accountability or the willingness to have a growth mindset at all times. And in my experiences, the hallmarks of coaches that are the best of the best and have not a flash in the pan success in their gym, but have consistent, reliable, continuous uh, systems that, you know, produce high level athletes that are happy and healthy, have that level of accountability. But also something that's really important, you said, is like the the ability to communicate and the ability to show from a role modeling point of view what you value and and, and show with a leadership point of view of, of putting in the work yourself to be there and have practice plans and think outside the box and admit when you don't know something like it's crazy how much the athletes see that and they reflect on that. And I think that's a really important takeaway point that people should, should kind of, you know, sink on is, you know, are you, like you said, just saying like, Oh, that group doesn't work hard. And you know, they're always just lazy or like, well, they're, they're never going to get stronger. They don't want to put the work in. Or do you have that conversation and ask them about, Hey, why, why aren't we really jiving on strength? What's going on? Why is everyone so low motivation? Like, is there something we should talk about, you know, willing to have that conversation and then link it to their goals. Like you said, like they might not like leg lifts and, and rope climbs and squat jumps and stuff, but they like getting new skills. They like having fun at meets. They like not being injured. And you have to kind of make that roadmap for them. Like, yeah, it's not fun, but all the things you like about gymnastics and being here with your friends, they happen because of these maybe not so fun elements. And so, I don't know, I just maybe rambled there, but so many important things you said. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, and I think along with that, sorry, do you have something to add there? You know, I did for a second there, but I lost it. So it's fine. You had a big, you had a big, like, yeah. it was really going to be profound. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back to it if I get there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think while we're, it's early, right? Give yourself a break. Yeah. 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 I, I've only had like a quarter cup of coffee. So <laughs> Oh, you know what I was going to say? I was just going to say, yeah, leadership by example, right? And that, yeah. you know, I think that's one of the things you just keyed on the most is, is, is that you, you have to set the example that you want. And so if, if every time, if I want a kid or we want a, as our program, if we want kids to uh, fail in new ways, trying to find success, then mm. we have to be okay with them failing in new ways, right? Um, and we have to be okay with uh, them uh, trying and not making it. And so if we only prioritize, you know, making a skill and we only reward making a skill and we don't say, well, hey, you fell over on that cast. But I tell you what, dude, your legs were straight mm. like and that that and that is the reward there is we just complimented the skill off fall. And that's OK, because we're teaching them that that. We're, we're prioritizing the quality over just making the skill, um, you know, and then, you know, uh, the same thing with attitudes, right. And, and uh, frustrations and how you use those in the gym. Um, you know, if, if we teach them that every time they make a mistake, we get flustered and jumbled and crazy and, and we get all nuts, then, you know, they start to do that too. As soon as they make a mistake, they go down the wrong road. And so, you know, we've always, we talked to the kids a little bit about like, you never want to be too high. You never want to be too low. You want to stay in this nice little pocket here where like, we're just enjoying the process and we're academically working through what do we need to do next. Right. And mm -hmm. it's not like I get so excited when I make something that I forget about the details that I didn't put into it. Or I get so depressed that 
I, for, I forget that I actually made a good correction in there. Right. right. And this, the skill wasn't made, but I did something well. Right. Mm. And like, I, there's, it's a fine balance. Right. Yep. Cause you know, you don't want kids to, you know, to just always miss, you know, I mean, that's part of what we do is teaching, teaching them to make gymnastics and, and to hit routines and things like that. Um, but it's but if but if we don't exhibit that calm and we don't show them that that middle of the road um, ability to control right emotions and things like that, then yeah. we certainly don't set them up for the success because you know most often they're gonna you know they're gonna follow our lead a little bit um, yeah. you know and it's it, it goes to everything right leadership is everything if you um if you're telling the kids not to sit in the gym then you shouldn't sit in the gym you know because if you're telling them that you want them to move uh 32 mats and there's 16 of them you know then go pick up two mats right yep. i mean go pick up three mats whatever right i mean there's nothing wrong with you helping along in the process you know if you got to clean up all the gym and you got to pick up all the extraneous trash and the the chalk wrappers and the tape balls and the you know, the bands and the sliders and the whatever, like, all right, go pick up some sliders, go pick up some tape balls, go pick up some stuff with them, you know, and so they always feel like you're invested in the process with them instead of always just commanding them to do right never and never being a part of that process with them. Um, and again, I, I you, you nobody's perfect, you know, and so we're not always going to set the perfect example. But but if people know the heart behind what you're doing, and they and you and you set a strong enough example consistently enough, then they're not going to go crazy because you didn't show them every time, right? They're gonna they're gonna follow along as much as possible. Yeah, and and there's like two things just screaming at me that are so important. You said one is that concept of role modeling emotional regulation. Like I have probably the biggest face palm moments I have are like thinking back to my younger years as a coach is when we would go to meets and I was easily flustered and, and thinking about this and I was like, you know, maybe not leading by example of how I should be calm in a meet and I was very jittery and I was getting upset with scores. I was getting upset with other coaches and the rotation and all the 47 things that go wrong in a meet, right? But then I would turn around and say like, I need you to be calm. Like, why can't you control yourself? Why are you getting all worked up? It's like, probably because they see me running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And so how in right. the world do we expect them to do it? But two is the role modeling that you just said about like, the, the willingness and the ability to learn from mistakes as, as your own mistakes as a coach, when you say, Hmm, I thought those drills were going to work. And I, th I don't think they are, or like, maybe we should pivot our strength program, or maybe we need some new ideas for how to structure practice, or maybe I'm doing something with that ratio of really hard, monotonous stuff to fun stuff. When you're actively willing to say, I don't know, or I need to learn, or I need to FaceTime somebody and call somebody or get a mentor. When they see you taking on that accountability and that responsibility, they're much more willing to do it themselves, which is like learning from their missed turns or learning from really big letdowns and meets it's like okay this is this is hard i understand this is hard for you and it hurts right now but like what can we learn from this situation what can we change what can we grow from right instead of being like a throw your hands up this is this always happens to me kind of victim mentality if they see you actively going through that accountability process i think that it reflects very positively on them and we as adults whether it's parents coaches medical providers i think we need to really take that seriously about what you do is much more valuable than what you say Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and just because you trip once or trip twice or trip, you know, three times or 20 times on that journey, doesn't mean that, you know, you shouldn't stay on that journey. Right. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I can think of, I can think of a million times that I've failed trying to do what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. And, and so I, but, but the intent is there every time, you know, and you go through that process every time and you try to figure out what did you do wrong every time. And then hopefully that all accumulates every, every, every time you do it, you get a little bit closer to living, mm -hmm. living out what you're trying to say. Right. And so, you know, I don't want to sit here and, and say like, you know, oh man, like I'm doing it all right. I'm not doing it all right. I, yeah. you know, I, I, and, and there's a lot of failures that go into it. Um, you know, and so it's just think about it right and and really really go through the process when those failures happen like wh where where did they go wrong why did they go wrong you know what was the decision that changed and flipped in your head when you, when you were trying to do this and you didn't right um you know and, and then and then maybe there's the the self-reflection points that you can set up for yourself too in um 
you know, if you feel yourself start going down the wrong road, you know, and you feel yourself start to get that frustration mode, you know, taking a step and, uh, you know, step back and practicing that pause for a second and really thinking through the, the issue and like, what am I frustrated about? And mm-hmm. like most often I, I find that like it, uh, it's less frustration with the athletes and it's more frustration with yourself. Right. And it's frustration that like the athletes aren't hitting because you didn't do something right. And so like, if we then take it out on them, when we are, when we knowingly know, like we, we did something wrong in that process, they're not ready. Right. And so mm-hmm that's us. That's our problem. And so, I mean, so, so we got to keep it in it to ourselves, you know, and we've got to, we got to work the process ourselves, and we need to not try to sling them along into it. Um, I don't know. So it's never just one person doing the job. It takes a, a team of good people. And uh, so our team at Ascend right now is, is really phenomenal. We have a good ownership group, uh, Brent and Lauren Phelps. Uh, they really they really listen. They really, uh, really care about our opinions. They really take them well. Uh, and they let us steer the ship a little bit, which is awesome. Lauren also coaches in the program and is phenomenal. Um, Chris Petrie does uh, vault for the upper levels and does a, a phenomenal job at that as well. And then, uh, you know, the person I work really, really, really close with, uh, Sarah Korngold, uh, had a lot of success at Paramount Elite uh, down in L.A. before she came up here. And, um, you know, it was one of the big selling points in, in, in making this move and this transition um, to Ascend as well. Uh, but she's phenomenal. She really, really complements my skill set well. We really play off of each other. I think that uh, as, as individual coaches, we have flaws. And so, therefore, having a team of people around you that helps play off of those flaws and can offset those flaws with the strengths of their own is really important. Um, and so I think that's really good about our staff is that we offset each other well and we really play to the strengths of the people in the program. Uh, and then and we also have this other guy, Kale Robinson, who is opening up a sister facility of, of Ascend right now with us. And um, and he had a lot of success at, at Airborne Gymnastics before he moved up to the Seattle area. So we're really excited about the staff that we have. We're really excited about uh, kind of the direction that we're going. And then I uh, just want to make sure to shout out those guys. Uh, you know, Sarah and Kale specifically have a lot to do with the social media content that we're putting out um, and, and our driving forces of that. So hashtag credit where credit is due. Got to throw them in there. Um, you know, phenomenal. And we're, we're excited about what we think we can do out here. So hoping to build off of that. You're, you're completely hitting the nail on the head and it, and it moves towards the next logical kind of bigger picture uh, conversation, which I know a lot of people are wondering is like this concept of like changing a gym's culture, but also just changing our entire sport culture. There's so many threads of what you're saying about, you know, trying to go for the progress over perfection mentality and trying to understand what's going wrong. Where can we change? How can we learn? All these things are much more relevant also in the larger context of a lot of issues we're facing in gymnastics right now. And I think, you know, we know, everybody knows there's an, a need for a large cultural change away from that, like, you know, early, younger year success, immediate gratification, like getting skills right now and pushing a lot of high level success for more of that kind of post puberty, delayed success, just development, a good foundation, and then build them later in life. I think a lot of people want that to happen, but are struggling to see how do I actually make that happen. And we can say over and over again that, you know, you should follow the examples of people that you you believe in, but it's really hard sometimes for people to have that patience and have that ability to wait, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old to not, you know, go so quick and want more and more and more. So can, I know, can we maybe shift the conversation more about some larger philosophical things that are, that are important related to maybe letting our sport evolve into one of later year development and l- delayed gratification a little bit in your experiences as a coach? No pressure. <laughs> ah, uh, <laughs> Fix the world in a podcast. That's pretty much what I'm asking, Brett. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that that's so, so deep of a, of a topic. Right. And there's so much that like is, it's not unknown. Right. But it's, it's untried and untested to a degree. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's hard because, you know, I mean, we can, we can hypothesize these things a little bit and then we can pick out a few examples and then there's a bunch of examples the other direction and you know it's 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 you know philosophically um 
we talked about before we talked about the you know the idea of the strong fundamental basics right we talked about teaching those things really strong at the beginning and the concept of if you don't have time to teach it right the first time when will you have time to teach it again and so like there's some of that where like you know you're rushing you're rushing you're rushing you're trying to teach all these things to the younger kids because the earlier they can get there the more time they have to mature at them and that mm. may or may not be true and that might work for some kids but there's a lot of kids where um they mature into their bad habits you know and their bad habits get get mature right rather than like getting a higher skill level out of it and so like going a little bit slower in the process and um and you know teaching those uh taking more time um is not such a bad thing right uh and you from a medical side uh can can speak to this probably more than i can but um i i guess uh, and I've, I've used this example a few times before in my conversations but like um Let's talk about a car, right? Um, if I buy a brand new car, I would drive down to Mexico and back five times, and I wouldn't even, I wouldn't worry about my car. I wouldn't worry about my mileage. I wouldn't worry about it at all, right? Yeah. But when I got two hundred thousand on the on the odometer, I'm not. I don't even want to drive to the to the grocery store anymore. You know what I mean? Because I'm not even sure if I'm going to get back. <laughs> yeah. And so, like when I get to 200,000, I could buy a new car. But when I get, when I get that mileage accumulated on an athlete, mm. I, I cannot buy another one, right? Yep. Uh, that, yep. You can't buy another body. You can't buy another physical form. And mm. so I guess that's, I guess that's the point of the conversation, right? Is yeah. how do we not put, how do we not put 200,000 miles on before we need to make our road trip? Right. Yeah. And, and how do we how do we limit the mileage a little bit through the process so that, you know, so that we feel comfortable and, and that athlete still has the tools left physically to achieve those goals. Right. Uh, wh when they're coming about. Um, and, you know, I, I know we talked about it a little bit in our previous conversations, but like, you know, uh, every time they crunch an ankle, you know, what, and I don't, there's no percentages to this, I'm making this up right now, but like it, it, every time they crunch their ankle, if they lose 2% off that ankle, right. Um, and, and, you know, and maybe that's completely off and it's, and it's BS, but like, um, let's say they lose 2% of functionality on that ankle or 2% of whatever, um, of just their, their life off that ankle. Um, yeah you know, and, and we let them do that, you know, a, a million times. And I mean, they don't have anything left when they need it later. Right. You know, it, we want to, we want to, we want to achieve that college goal, but like their ankles dead. They don't, mm. they don't have anything to get off the floor anymore. They're, they're struggling. Right. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's hard because we don't have, we don't have a little counter, you know, where like every time somebody does something, we count every single rep of everything they do. And there's like this optimal perfect number that we have to create that's scientifically proven, right? Like we don't have that. And so without that, then it's trying to monitor, you know, how much do you do in a day? How many hyperextensions do you do without sitting there and counting? You know, if you got 50 kids in a workout, you're not, I mean, realistically, you know, yeah. if you were, if you were sitting there with a clipboard and you were just counting skills, you wouldn't be coaching. You wouldn't yeah. be coaching quality. You wouldn't be coaching technique. You would be counting, right? And so are we going to pay somebody to come in with a clipboard and sit there and just count skills for every kid, right? Like, no, we're not going to do that for an 18-year career either. And right. so, you know, I, I mean, and that's where, you know, maybe planning comes into play where you plan out certain things and you decide that, you know, we're only going to do this many of this per yep. week, um, you know, and, and, and like I said, you, you would speak more from medical side to the optimal dose kind of stuff. Um, yep. and you, and you do speak to that. Um, but yeah, but, but then we go then, so circle back to the beginning of the conversation when you're saying to pushing that, um, that, that, uh, that age bracket up yep. for our, for our higher level, have a higher level success. Um, you know, you see it works for some athletes, right? Like, um, I think Allie Raceman was 18 in her first mm -hmm. Olympics and then 22 in her second Olympics. Right. Um, you know, Simone, Simone is a little bit older as well. So like, um, you know, those are very gifted athletes. Those are, but they, but they are great and they are arguably better now 
than they were, right? Or or I, not now, I, but I should say. Simone is when better now than when she was in her first Olympics, right? Um, at 12 Allie, versus 22. Allie Raisman was better in her second Olympics at 22 versus what she was at 18. And so, um, you know, it, it, th- those are good just examples to put out there, um, you know, that it, they didn't have to be the young Sprite, right? Like they were able to continue to grow and keep learning. Um, and there's a lot of things at play there, right? Like if we overdo the numbers at a young age, they can't last till they're 22, right? Like that's not, it, we take away the option um, mm-hmm. if we're if we're not careful, you know, we run up the odometer too high, um, you know, and, th- and then it's the decision of like, well, I've got an athlete that can make a double back 80% of the time on the hard floor. Um, so I have a choice. Am I going to put it in a routine right now as 12 year old? She makes it 80%. You know, 20% of the time she crunches that ankle. Okay. And then, so I have to, it's a pride decision. Do I want to put that double back in and she crunches her ankle? Um, You know, and and I let that happen 20% of the time. And then, you know, the end of the season, she's hobbling and, you know, we're resting for a bunch of time over the summer now to get that ankle right. And we lose some of that developmental time that we don't want to take advantage of, right? So maybe we'd be a little bit smarter and we do a double full last pass instead because she can make that a hundred percent of the time. And you know, and and it's not worth as much. And 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 but those are hard decisions to make, right? Especially for for, for coaches and parents and kids that want to be competitive, right? right. They, every everybody wants to be competitive. And if you're not competitive, you know, there's not that much there's not enjoyment in not doing well either or not being as competitive as you know you're capable of being right and so that's where it's so hard is because there's no perfect decision yeah right but it's like i don't know take the things you know um that 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 are true and and try to work with them as much as possible and try to make the best decision that you can with the idea that you want that kid you want that kid to be as physically able and healthy as possible moving forward Right. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that helps at all. Or if that's even it does, it does a lot, lot, relevant, but I don't want to interrupt you because it's just very good. So I don't want to butt in, but well, there's two things that I think are so important there. One is the, the rate at which you accumulate miles when you're young, right? That's really important is like how, how fast you tick that odometer up when mm-hmm. someone is, you know, younger, they, they're more, they bounce around a lot. They got energy. They're just focused on gymnastics. Like you got to really manage that accumulation of those early, say 50,000 miles, 100,000 miles, but also is how much of those miles are junk miles versus how much of those are really efficient, optimal miles, right? Like, are you just putting on extra volume and extra skill repetition because, um, it, you want to, like you said, it's a pride decision. If you want to see 10 volts or 15 volts today, or like, can you do five and then do a whole bunch of extra stuff to promote that athlete really, really well, successfully that conversation of, Again, back to the, I think the best thing you've said so far is the rationale for why are you doing it? Why are you picking certain technical drills? Why are you doing 10 beam routines versus five? Why are you doing this kind of strength conditioning during this part of the year, but it's different down the road? Or like, why are you competing at double back at 12 versus 14 and waiting until they go through puberty a little bit more and their bone, their growth centers fuse fully, right? Like you have to really have a hard conversation or a well rationaled conversation about why you're doing things. And I think a lot of times, unfortunately, me being victim number one as a younger coach is I just fell into that rhythm and that pattern of, well, my coach did this and I watched a couple of coaches do this. So I'm going to do this because I think that it's the best way to go. And you kind of realize that what works for one doesn't work for all, but also it's not always the, just because everyone's doing it doesn't mean it's the right thing. <laughs> you know, there's sometimes when maybe pivoting away a different idea is really, really important, but um, that's challenging. It's really challenging to do when, you know, you, you see that athlete who's really young and excited and ready to go. And you're thinking about, okay, they're 12 and they would like to go to college someday. How in the world do I manage the next six years, especially with the pressures of college recruiting and stuff on top of that? It's challenging, really challenging. Yeah. The the way I was going to go with the conversation next is kind of the, we had talked about in our previous conversation, the gray area, right. About making, making these coaching decisions. And you and I both have had an experience where, you had to make a really hard decision on, you know, pulling the plug on a skill or not competing a meet because an ankle was sore, or ah, I don't think the shoot over is just ready enough to do safely out of a, out of a pirouette or something of that nature. And it's really hard because you have a lot of stakeholders in the game. Of course you want the athlete to do it, right? The gymnast wants to do it. The parent wants you to do it. Everybody wants you to do it, but you sometimes look like the bad guy, quote unquote, as a, as a coach who's at a meet and you're warming up. And as you and I have a, a, a vault example, we can talk about is like, well, that doesn't look 
great like it used like it doesn't look like it wasn't practice like i'm a little worried here about what's going on whether it's the time of the meet and the new equipment and whatever else it is so uh, would you mind sharing your vault story because i have the exact same vault story and kind of how you learn or grew from this situation uh yeah so i um, mean a couple years ago uh you know had an athlete training vaults in the gym and she was doing a you know a great job lay foals yachinko lay foals um you know and, and she's getting ready to debut at a competition and she's she's looking good in training it's it's been going well it's been pretty consistent and uh you know we feel like all right we're gonna go out to this one and we think we're gonna do it right and uh so we go to the competition and it's uh you know it's just uh, there's there's too many variables that have changed right we're in an arena now instead of in a gym um we got a spief board versus an ai board we got a spief table versus an ai table and we got 20 centimeter matting you know that we're using a four incher on top because we don't want to keep boosting that up with an eight incher and then all of a sudden we're taking away the landing space and all that other stuff right so she starts warming up and she's doing some okay layouts and you know it just doesn't quite look quite the same pop that she usually has right it's okay it's okay. Right. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trusting the athlete. I'm trusting the training You know, I'm trusting that she really wants to do this. And, and so, you know, we do a couple of lays and then we go, okay, we're going to fold the next one. She shorts the full. And so, you know, at that point I'm like, okay, you know, like, Hey bud, like, you know, you've got it. So we've just got to really stay down on that board. we got to really finish that punch, right. Just be a little bit more committed to that block through, like, don't question it, man. Like, no, you got it. Be a little more aggressive with it. Like, you know, you've got this, you're good. Right. You know, trying to pump them up. And, yep. and, and, and so she shorts the second one. And, and at that point, it's kind of like, well, like, I know it's not going the way that I want it to go. Um, but the athlete says she's got it. I, you know, I know she's capable, um, you know, but, but it's just not quite there. And so I let her, com I let her compete it. Ultimately, I let her compete it. And, and she, she shorted it and, and, and busted the ankle and, and it took a long time to come out of it. And she lost the last half of her season. She lost the whole second half. She lost the opportunity, you know, um, to finish off that year. And, you know, I go back and I, I think about it and I question it, like all of those variables, like I saw it coming. And instead of being the bad guy and pulling the plug on that moment, you know, I kept supporting the athlete and I kept trying to do the right thing by, you know, rooting her on and you, you know, you could do it and being confident with her and like giving her that confidence. Um, but ultimately, you know, with all those variables, um, that's where I have to, I had to make a smarter decision. I had to know that it just wasn't there that day. Right. And it's like, uh, you can have a Cy Young pitcher and they come out in the first inning and they get shelled for five runs. You know, it's just not their day. Right. Yeah. And like, we understand that. So we take them out and we replace them with the next guy because that, that amazing athlete just doesn't have it that day. Mm. And so I think maybe, you know, maybe that's the lesson that, that I'm trying to learn through that is that some days they just don't have it, you know, whatever it is, they didn't sleep well. They didn't, they, you know, they didn't get the, the nutrients in their food that they normally get. They didn't, they're a little more stressed because of school or whatever it is. Like maybe they just don't have it one day. And that's where, and this is kind of the, the point I was going to make before and kind of got sidetracked in my head from was, um, is the concept of like, uh, athlete versus program. Right. And like, is the program more important than the athlete or is the athlete more important than the program? Right. And like trying to find the balance between the two. Mm. The, pr the program is important. Right. The way we do things is important. There's a cultural expectation like that is, you know, that, that can be productive and positive. Right. But then the athlete needs to, um, you know, the athlete needs to be just as important in that in that equation. Um, you know, we can't. We can't say that, you know, uh, the the assignment is ten. Mm. Get it done. The assignment ten, right? Like on a kid that doesn't have it that day physically, they can't. They it's it's not working. It's not a good idea, or mm. they have a little bit of a sore foot. It's not bad enough that they're like, I want to stop, but it's bad enough that maybe two is a better idea or three is a better idea, right? Yeah. Or maybe let's, I know it says hard side today. You know, I know it says hard routine, but why don't we, why don't we resi land this one? Yep. Right. And like, that might not be what the program says for that day, 
but it might be it might be the choice that helps along that athlete's season career. Um, you know, and 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 like I, I I've made the wrong decision before, so like I'm not I'm not telling you it's an easy decision to make all the time, but like I don't know, it's just something to keep in mind, perhaps. Yeah. And I have a story too. I'll share that's equally from the same. And, and the reasons that I, unfortunately, this is when I was like, you know, five, six years ago as a really young coach is the, unfortunately the reason that I made this decision because of was the, I guess the selfish reasons for the gym of wanting to look successful is we came from a smaller gym and we have three level nines and this one level nine, it could be the first time she makes it to Easterns. If all these meets go well and she qualifies, and it would be huge for our gym because we haven't qualified a girl to Easterns in a long time. And so that was kind of on our back. But then also is that we only had three nines at the time. And so we wanted to to do well competitively as a team. Right. And so we're, we're really excited as a small gym who's making some noise. Right. And the athlete, same exact thing, you know, all during the week, the shoot over to hand looks great. looks awesome. We're ready to fire up for the meet. We warm up for the meet. And I'm like, well, that tap looks a little bit different. And like, Oh, that's not exactly how it looked in practice. And it, almost the exact same conversation you had. I was like, you got this, right. Just like trust your, tr trust your tightness and know what, like watch your feet, all that kind of stuff. I'm razzing her up. And it happens again. And sure enough, you know, warm ups are over and, and she's looking at me like, what should we do? And I'm like, I think you got it, you know? And in my mind, I know exactly. I should be like, nah, we're not doing this today. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't care what the score looks like. I don't care what it looks like on the other side. I don't care what the the audience looks at me at or whatever it is, but I made the wrong decision and I let her do it. She missed her hand and she landed really hard on she on her, on her like kind of, you know, thank God she was okay, but she landed really hard and missed a hand. And I really, you know, regret it was the worst coaching decision I ever made. But when I look back into it and I realized why I did it is because I got blinded by the program, not the athlete, right? I thought more about she can qualify to Easterns and this and that. And like, we can have a nice little level, level nine placement for the first time on the podium in a long time. And these gyms have 10 level nines and we only have three, like all that kind of crap that was in my head. I really uh, had a harsh dose of, of medicine there about like, no, it's, it's not about those things. It's about the athlete's health because we had to go all the way back to square one after she missed a couple of weeks to, to refix it. And she was scared, big mental block. Now it always became this kind of touchy, touchy thing about, are we going to be okay? And uh, it was hard. It was really hard to get over that. But uh, I just want people listening to know is that, as you said, we're not perfect and we're making these things, but everybody knows that gut feeling they have when it just doesn't feel right. And you're like, Hmm, what's going on here? You know, do we have to pull the plug? Even if that person really doesn't like you that day and the parent maybe is upset with you or somebody else's, but you know, when, and when everybody cools down, you're happier on the other side of it when you go back in the gym on Monday and you don't have an ankle to deal with, you don't have a mental block to deal with. So it's hard, but you have to be willing to have that, that spine to stand on, you know, when you're in front of everybody, it's hard. Yeah. Well, and, and then I guess the next part of that is, and, you, and you're talking about how that decision stands up in the crowd too, is like when your gut says something, the reason usually, right, you can, you can see it and you know it. And then if you choose not to act on it, um, that's the only way you get your proof. Right. Yep. So like if, if, if my gut says I should not do this, uh, she looks a little too nervous in the corner before this, uh, double Arabian or whatever, whatever skill it is. Um, you can see the confidence of the athlete. You can see the mindset. You can see the nervous jitters. You can see some of that. Right. And like, uh, the, you know, there's a certain amount that might be an acceptable level in your head, but when you see the extra, the extra hand wipes and the extra, uh, you know, uh, back up in the corner and turn and look and, and, and kind of getting all sketchy and stuff. Um, if you tell that kid, you know what, I don't think we're ready. Let's go back a step. Right. Mm. Then you don't, it, your, your, your belief is never proved correct. Right. Right. But if you don't pull the plug on it and that kid locks a leg out and blows her knee out, you get the proof you wanted to, to, to know that your gut was right, but somebody else just paid a, a hefty price. Right. And so I guess maybe that's the hardest part is this is, is that you don't want the proof, right? Yeah. And so it's, you, you'll never know if it was the right decision, but that right decision might've just saved something that you didn't want to happen. Right. I might've, I might've, I wouldn't have gotten the proof that not vaulting that day would have been a good decision. Right. But like, right that kid paid the price for it later that like, I, I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't need that proof. I, I shouldn't have needed that proof. Right. Yeah, so, absolutely. It's, tough. It, it's very tough. And I think there's, there's kind of in my mind, there's always two types of athletes that kind of fall into this. There's one is that the athlete obviously wants to do it. They're super fired up and they want to go for it, but you have to protect the athlete from themselves in that situation. Whereas 
they are maybe ignoring that blinking red light in their own head about like, ooh, this doesn't feel great or that warm up turn didn't feel great. And they're trying to say, no, I'm going to do it anyways. You have to be the adult there and step in and say like, hey, I know you want to do it. I want you to do it. Your mom wants you to do it. We all want you to do it. But listen, today's not the day, as you said, right? There's another... <clears throat> Next week or two weeks, we can work on it. But also, too, there's sometimes, in my experience, there's also another category of athlete who wants nothing more than you to make that decision for them because they're terrified and they know it doesn't feel right, but they're too scared to say they don't want to disappoint you. They don't want to disappoint themselves. And you kind of give them the air cover when you step in and say, hey, you know what? It's just it's not going to happen today. No big deal. It's all good. Let's just let's just get through this event and we'll, we'll wash our hands and we'll go to the next one. Right. And I think both of those athletes, the one that is so blinded by emotions, they can't see the possible negative. And then the one who you know, knows they don't want to do it and, and want someone to help them make that decision are both really, really important. But your ability as a coach to step in and do that is one of the best ways that you can demonstrate the human is more important than the gymnast, right? Like that, that emotional intelligence to see those little like extra hand wipes and those, you know, those jittery nerves and stuff like that. That's how you build really good trust and really good culture because you show empathy. You show, I care about you and your health long-term and your performance long-term. I don't care about this immediate gratification of whatever we have. And I think maybe that's the takeaway is that, you know, it's hard to do that in the moment, but in the long run, the reward on investment is the athlete going like, wow, this person really cares about me. And sometime down the road, when something comes up and you say, no, actually, I think you're good to go and they do it well, you, you have that balance of pushing and pulling when you need to. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and I think the next progression, this is a wonderful, the way the conversation is flowing is, you know, we're kind of hitting at some of these larger systemic issues and something I hear a lot from coaches who message me or listen to the podcast is like, I get it. I love what you're saying. I really want to change, but I'm either stuck in a gym that does not want to change. And I'm surrounded by people who are not as open-minded as maybe I am or you are, but also like they feel as though some of the structural, uh, systematic approaches to the sport and the competitive season and the levels and especially the nationals road and stuff like that or colleges puts a massive pressure on them to have to push the athlete really young and so i'd love to shift the conversation and wrap up here about you know your ideas with your proposal which is fantastic and you know you and i have talked about how you feel as though the concepts around your proposal are very much going to help uh, ameliorate some of these stresses that coaches have. So for people that are maybe unfamiliar, can you share maybe the basics and the skeleton of it? And then we can talk about some, some nuanced specifics of why you believe in it. Uh, yeah, I'll kind of, I'll try to generalize it a little bit and then kind of sure. give you a, kind of some examples of, of how it looks, um, you know, structurally. Um, but it, this all came about, um, you know, I mean, there was a few years ago, obviously, uh, you know, the uproar in the gymnastics community and, and rightfully so. Um, and, uh, you know, people are saying, you know, fire Carrie Perry and get out rid of the leadership and the CEO and we need the leadership. And like, I, I can I can agree with a lot of those things. Right. Um, but but to go beyond that, I think that I think that when we change the system that we operate under, it gives us an opportunity to. Um, to influence culture and influence some decision making within the process a little bit more, right? And so, you know, the CEO of the of the of the, the USA Gymnastics is never going to walk into the gym and you know monitor my coaching, right? And and so so we need a system in place that helps order those decisions a little bit better. And so that was kind of where this came from, um, you know. And I've got some specific examples of like kids that I kind of used in my head. When I was coming up with this, but the idea behind it is, uh, you know, for JO Nationals is currently what we have right now is a system where you must be an all arounder to compete at JO Nationals, right? Um, and uh, the college system allows for specialization um, and, you know, uh, individual qualifications from specialization as well. Um, you know, towards their national meet. Uh, the elite system has uh, individual event specializations that occur, um, and the JO system does not. And so, um, you know, and that's the 99% of athletes, right? Uh, that's not the smaller percentage, that's the larger percentage. And so, um, you know, the concept is, is we're going to try to get uh, individual event qualification standard um, allowed into JO nationals. Right. And so I say it that way because I want it to be individual event qualification. It's not specialization. It doesn't require you to specialize, right. It just allows for that path. If you, if you want it or need it. Um, yeah. but you could be an all arounder who is, you know, you're like popcorn on the beam, you know, um, you know, and you're flying all over the place, but then you're a phenomenal bar worker, right. Um, the quality of your beam necessarily does not 
dictate the quality of your bars, right? Like, um, and so for those two things to be judged exactly the same, um, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, um, I don't know, it doesn't feel completely correct to me. Um, when you're looking at a routine, you don't have to look at an all around to appreciate uh, one specific amazing event, right? You know, you can watch Nina Durwall's bars and go, oh my God, that is incredible. She's amazing. I don't need to see her beam to know that her bars is amazing. You know what I'm saying? So like, I think that's just part of the thing is learning how to um, appreciate the quality of gymnastics rather than simply the quantity of gymnastics that's being performed. And so mm -hmm. the goal of the proposal, and it's been out there for a couple of years, and there's uh, two different proposals that have been put forth so far. Um, you know, and, and, and I'd like to see this hopefully get, get through the, the, the finish line this year. Um, but it's allowing for, like I said, individual event qualification into JO nationals, right. Um, and, 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 and opening that door and becoming an opportunity for specialists to finally go to nationals or kids that, you know, are, are just phenomenal on two events and just the other two are just not their thing. Right. Um, those kids still find great places in college teams. A lot of times, right. They're still productive in the, in the gymnastics world. Um, you know, but then there's other kids that we don't quite make it to that step because they're so frustrated by their inability to get in front of college coaches at Joe nationals or their inability to feel successful um, within the, the JO program. Right. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, I put, I, like I said, I put, I put forth two different proposals so far and specifically the, the first one was a seven plus one system. So every region qualifies their seven all arounders per age group, like they always have. Right. And then you're adding a plus one on every event. Okay. So the plus one is just individual event qualification for every event. So you have eight competitors up on every event you go to, you go to, you know, mm -hmm. across the board at the nationals. Right. Um, and that was, you know, I actually started, you know, when I first pitched the idea, I started a four and three, you know, and I was like four all arounders, three event qualifications. And, and, and it's just a little too complicated and it's a little bit, you know, it stresses the system a little too much. Um, you know, some coaches were very mad at me for like the idea of taking away all around spots. And, and, and that was never my goal. My never, my goal was never like, Oh, I want to take away opportunity. I don't want all rounders to go. Right. It was just trying to find an open door to the other. Um, and so, you know, slowly that shifted, you know, and we went to more of a six and a two, and then we thought of like a six and a one. Um, and ultimately, you know, it ended up with a seven one because it, it, it didn't take away any opportunity from all around, but it added something for the individual events. Right. And so the next iteration of the proposal, um, you know, and it, it, I, I will say that it was well-received, right. The proposal was well-received, but it didn't make it over the finish line. Right. Um, you know, and, and so we just need a little bit extra community support for, for it. And we just need to kind of bang down the doors a little bit and, and get to the point where we can get this thing through. But the next iteration of it is, uh, you know, I called it the wild card system. Um, and it's a separate session. So it would be like Friday night after the normal training day. Um, you're going to do a session of wild card, right? And um, so it, by having a separate session, it doesn't affect the flow of the normal JO national sessions. It will still be a JO national session, right? But you're going to do uh, seven per event per region, and you're going to do two uh, all arounders. Okay. And five individual event qualifications per uh, age group per event. Right. And so the two all arounders would be the top two athletes across the entire region that didn't qualify within their age group. Okay. Um, and so the reason for that would be, you know, I mean, and we've seen it every year uh, in different regions, but you get in that one buzzsaw age group, um, you know, and, and region one was this a couple of years ago where a 37, nine was in eighth place, a 37, nine was not in nationals. Now that kid ended up getting a spot because another region didn't fill that age group. And so they got bumped over, but even then the next down, one down was like a 37, eight. Right. And then that would go to nationals in every other age group across the country, essentially. Right. Yeah. And so if you got caught in a buzzsaw age group, instead of, you know, you, you lost your opportunity, even though you, you rightfully deserved by the quality of gymnastics to be on that stage. So it would just be like a little bit of protection for those two kids that kind of just got caught in bad age groups. Right. And then the next five slots per event would be your top five individual event placements 
across the whole regional competition. Um, you know, so you're guaranteeing it's going to be some pretty dang quality gymnastics um, yeah. across the board. I mean, I, I put together a spreadsheet on it and everything, you know, and, and, and depending on what region you were talking about, you know, as far as a deeper region or a, a thinner region. Um, but those deeper regions, you know, or uh, even the mid-tier regions, you know, you're sending out nine eights, nine sixes, nine sevens, you know, on those events. So the, the quality of gymnastics is arguably very high. Um, uh, yeah, and so that's the basic uh, you know, concept. That's the, that's the, that's the purpose. Right. Um, you know, and, and hopefully, uh, it can solve some issues. Right. Um, and do you want me just to keep riffing or do you want to ask specific yeah. questions about it or jump in and say the things that we, when we had talked previously in our conversations, the two really big things that I love about this kind of system is one is that it gives people more opportunities, right? Like you had rightfully said, there's some uh, athletes that just dominate two events and struggle on two events, but they get a great opportunity in college somewhere because they, they crush it on those two events and the team really needs it. So it's a really good way for those kids that maybe either just unfortunately like you know just wasn't for them on that event or maybe they had like a, a freak of freak of nature uh ankle injury right and floor and vault just never fully came back right and whether we talk about that in the long term or the other side of the second reason that i love it is because say someone does have one of those injuries in season and they're just like as you had told me they're under so much pressure mentally and physically to push that timeline to get back for floor and for vault to make all around to go to nationals it's an enormous amount of stress on the kid on the coach on the parent to have to kind of you know, fight biology, right? To go against the, the grain of what biology says is a timeline for a fracture or for a growth plate injury. And, you know, if you were able to have a system where you could qualify on bars and beam, right? And even we talk about on the guy side too, if we had an opportunity to qualify in the events that didn't involve your injury, you could have so much less stress in the last three months of your season, just focusing on those two things, letting your ankle get healthy. And then when nationals is done, you can start progressing back safely for floor and for vault uh, on the outside. So those are the two things that I think are the most beneficial. And I love about it is the opportunity to help more kids, but also the putting health on the front burner as the most important thing mentally and physically. So are there other things beyond those two that you feel are really big um, advantages to having something like this? Uh, you know, yeah, to a degree. Right. But, but, but what you're talking about is, you know, and I, I like to use analogies cause I just like to spin it in a perspective that makes you think of something not in its purest form. Right. But like look at it from a different angle. And so, you know, it's, it's like we were talking about on the phone the other day. Um, you know, it's like an Instapot, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, that steam builds up that pressure cooker, that steam builds up. And then it, without the, the, the pressure release valve, um, you know, if you just open that pot, it, I mean, it just like yeah. explodes in your face. Right. And so you, you, you open that, that pressure release valve and you let the steam out. And then when you open it, it's nice and easy. Right. And so, uh, kind of like you're talking about for these injuries and things like that, um, a mid season injury or an, or an early season injury, um, you know, I mean, it, it, it's exactly what you're saying. It's a chance to not take extra risk on, uh, on an injured body part. And it might not even be injured anymore, but it's not strong enough to support the impact and the forces that we're putting on it, you know, on a, on a vault or on a, on a floor routine or whatever it is. Right. And so coaches all the time have to make that decision of like, well, you're technically healthy enough to do it. Right. Mm. And so, you know, you might rush the timeline a little bit and, you know, you go, well, uh, you know, this kid needs to get in front of these college coaches. They need to make JOs. It's really important. Um, you know, and it, and it pushes, it pushes the bad decisions. Right. Yeah. And so if we create this, this pressure release valve, um, where we have some sort of individual event qualification standard, um, you know, that kid may or may not get in. Right. But like, you're giving them an option. You're, give, you're giving them the option to train the things that they should be training um, versus uh, forcing people into a certain decision, right? Um, you know, and and I I think it I think hopefully this affects um, motivation. I think hopefully this affects attrition rates and things like that um, yeah. because. You know, uh, and I can I can think clearly of uh, uh, one of the kids. You know, I was thinking about when I was coming up with this concept. Right? Is uh, you know, I had this kid that uh, was a really really good bar worker, right? Really good bar worker, and she had a, a a really good season, and she could only do a pretty decent layout, right? It wasn't an exceptional layout. It wasn't a great layout. It was a pretty decent layout, right? On vault, and um, 
you know, but she's got a killer bar routine, you know, that went nine, eight plus at times. Mm -hmm. Um, and she ended up being the, the first alternate nationals this one year. Right. And, um, she didn't get in the meet. She didn't compete. Right. And she was proud of herself for, for what she accomplished. Right. Being an, being an alternate is great, but she wanted to get in that meet. And so, um, coming off of that, you know, throughout the whole summer, um, you know, she's trying to, trying to figure out like on vault, like, how do I solve this problem? Right. Which is what you want to do anyway. If you want to be the best version of yourself, you're always trying to figure it out. But, right. but it always came back to vault is holding me back. Vault is the reason I didn't make it. Vault is the reason why I can't be good. Vault is this. And like, there was just so much pressure in that kid's head based on that one weakness. Right. And it stole her enjoyment and pride of what she was really great at, right? She didn't get to look at her bars as like, oh my God, like I'm super great. Like she looked at vault and was like, I'm not good over here. This is bad. I'm not good enough. I can't get this. I'm so frustrated. I can't get this. And so just having a situation like that, where you, you know, you can give those kids those opportunities. Like, yes, work on this. Like, absolutely work on that vault. Like, but don't make it the only thing that is the priority. And that's all you can think about. That's all you can focus on. That's all you can like, um, you can stress about um, because it's the one thing that's holding you back instead of, you know, instead of getting to build off of what our, you, you know, your good qualities are and your strengths are. And, you know, we teach it across life so much is that you take your strengths and you take advantage of them and you build a life off of those strengths, right? Like if I'm not a good orator, you know, and I'm not good at making uh, debate or verbal arguments, like I probably shouldn't go get a trial lawyer. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, and, yeah. But like, but if I'm, but if I'm great on the backside of things, you know, maybe I can be a legal assistant that's a researcher and really helps prepare those cases, but I shouldn't be the one out at, at trial, you know, yeah. making the arguments because that's not what my strengths are. Right. And so we teach people to use their strengths to build a life, to use their strengths, to build a career and, and, and to enjoy themselves and to have those passions and things. And, um, you know, I, I just think giving some system, sy systemic um, uh, backup to those concepts would be valuable and important. And I think it would send a message. It would send a message that like, you know, I mean, and this might be an extreme example, but let's say a kid is born with a hand deformity and they don't have uh, full digits on their hand and therefore cannot be a bar worker, right? Can't do it. But that kid worked their butt off through the whole system and created a vault and a floor routine that were national caliber, yep. right? Currently, right now, we would tell that kid they're not good enough for RJO Nationals, right? They don't hold enough value in our system to allow them an opportunity to compete at our national championships. And it's not based on a quality of comp, uh, of competition. It's not based on a quality of gymnastics. It's based on a quantity of gymnastics, right? And so I, you know, I fundamentally think that that's a little bit flawed in, in the way that we're doing things. And I think that that's something that we can solve. And, and ultimately what it comes down to is I don't care if they pass my proposal, right? Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't have to be like my perfect iteration of what this is. It's the goal is create opportunity, right? And so if anybody, you know, if anybody wants to, wants to figure out and, and look at it and go, well, this isn't the, this isn't good enough. It's not the right way. Um, you know, that's fine. I've spent a lot of time with a lot of people talking it through. I've spent a lot of time, you know, working through the details and how to make it, how to make it work within the system. Um, and I think that what we came up with is pretty good. Um, but ultimately, like, I'm not married to this proposal passes as is or, or kill it, right? Yeah. It's uh, this, co this concept is solid. This concept is good. This concept is important. Here's the best version we came up with. If you guys feel like, you know, from a USAG perspective that you want to maybe move something in there, you know, I'm, I'm sure that can be a conversation and that can be something to come up with. But, but ultimately, um, do you believe in the concept behind it? Do you believe in the purpose? Do you believe in the philosophical, um, you know, uh, point? Um, and then, and then use that as a working point and kind of, kind of decide where you want to go with it. Right. Um, yeah. you know, and, and like I said, with analogies, I, I think that like, uh, 
you know, I, I think you look at it from a different sport perspective, you know, and you look at basketball and like basketball has like four main skills, right? Shooting, passing, dribbling, and, and maybe rebounding as, as, as your four kind of main things. Right. And like, um, there's no perfect archetype for what a hall of fame player looks like, right? right? Like Shaquille O'Neal is a very different player from Muggsy Bogues or mm. from, you know, maybe that's not the best, best analogy, but like, um, you know, let's say an Allen Iverson or yep. a Steph Curry. Right. And so like, you don't ask Shaquille O'Neal to take the ball from one side of the court to the other side of court, you know, make three dribble moves, get around the guy and go up for his, his dunk. You know, you ask, you ask Shaquille O'Neal to go, go down there in the post, back that guy down and dunk over the top of him, Right. Yep. Or get that rebound and put it back. Um, yep. You know, if you had a free throw, if you had two free throws to win the NBA finals, you don't want Shaquille O'Neal on the line. Right. Yep. And he's a hall of fame player. Yep. Hall of Fame player that doesn't have all of the skills that are required to be like the best basketball player, right? And so, you know, I mean, I, you look at like swimming for events, you know, for every Michael Phelps that there is, and for every amazing like all around swimmer that does that IM race, um, you know, there's way more specialization, mm -hmm. right? In, in strokes, and and you know, I mean, uh, even like uh, heavy specialization between uh, distances. Yep. Right. Um, yep. You know, you don't put Simone Manuel up against Katie Ledecky. Right. Like, I mean, it's just there. There's specialization and there's qualities of like uh, of sport um, that that go into um, different positions and different, you know, uh, events and things like that, that yep. I, it, it, it just we don't have to have everybody in this box, you know, and you, you go to the you go to the Olympic stage and the elite stage, right? Like Ashton Locklear was never going to make a team as an all arounder. And I'm not saying that as a as a down to Ashton Locklear, but like she had some knee issues and things like that. Right. And so like it wasn't the best idea to continue to beat her up and train those really hard. But yep. she made a world team for bars, right? Yep. Bars and she did beam. Um, and so like, uh, you know, Madison Koshin made the team. She was a decent all arounder, but she wasn't a top, top, top notch all arounder to, to compete all around for that team. But she was absolutely there because she was a phenomenal worker. Right? right. And so like the elite stage gets it, the college stage gets it. They both implement those systems in what they do. And then the JO system is just still not there yet. And so I just think that for the 99%, you know, if we can, if we can build in that pressure release valve for the injury stuff, if we can put this in for a cultural, um, you know, perspective, uh, I just think that there's a lot of benefits to it. So sorry, I went on forever, but go riff, think about it, talk about it, whatever. No, it's great. I think it's, it's important for people to have those conversations about what systematic changes we can make to kind of impact things on a positive level for, for the, the future. It's, it's absolutely on board. And I, I agree with people should at least have the conversation and think about, you know, what can we do and move the chess board at a bigger picture than just that. And, um, I have one more curveball question for you and then we'll get out of here. But, um, this just popped into my head as we were talking about systemic changes, but do you think it would be beneficial, not beneficial, or we should or not maybe, um, change the age of competition for like level 10 and for competing like very hard skills, like D level passes, stuff like that. Do you think, cause that's a conversation the figs having now with the elite system for juniors and seniors. And a lot of people have emailed me saying, do you think we should do something like that as well for um, level nine, level 10 age brackets? And so as someone who hasn't had a lot of level 10 athletes go to nationals, I don't think I have the best perspective here to say it would be good or not. So I'm curious your opinion. If you don't want to talk about it, we can skip it, but. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Um, it's an interesting thought, right? Um, yeah. And I fully understand that conversation. Um, you know, I think that, you know, especially I think the elite shines a light on this a lot, right? Um, because there it's a it's a little more visible than just your everyday like level nine, level ten that jumps in early, right? Yep. Um and so, you know, I mean when you have these twelve year old elites and thirteen year old elites and they start doing these really hard routines and they keep like pounding, pounding, pounding and like the you know, you gotta get your start value up so you're doing longer routines. Um, with those longer routines comes, you know, the inconsistencies in practice, which means that you're adding those extra reps on because, you know, maybe they're still not super mature skills. Um, 
uh, you know, and they're, you're, they're young enough and they're light enough that when they crash, they don't crash quite as hard. So maybe it's not, it doesn't look like it's as damaging, um, but over time it does. Uh, and so, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think I, there's certainly, there's certainly validity to the argument that if you push those things back, you're not putting them in competition as early, right? And if you're not putting them in competition as early, you're probably not sequencing them all together quite as often, which means you're also not putting on quite as many reps of gym. So maybe you're doing, instead of competing it, because you don't have to compete it yet, you're doing all soft landings, right? Yeah. You're still developing the skills, right? Because if you don't develop the skills, you'll never get to those levels. You'll never get to level 10. So like we do need to develop the skills, but like, I mean, there, there's something to be said for, um, you know, guiding people in their decision-making, right? And so like, okay, I mean, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, you keep developing it and you have soft landings and you have a double pike, a double tuck and a full in as a 12 year old, but like you've taken all soft landings on it forever. So that the, you know, the 10 you did bad, um, compared to the 90, you did good. The 10 you did bad weren't punitive in the same way as they would be if you were out competing it on hard floor, um, or training it consistently on that hard floor landing. And yeah. so, yeah, so I, I don't know that there, I don't know the right answer. Um, yeah. no, but I, no. but, but I, I definitely understand that. Like, I, yeah. There's validity to that that argument and that if you train really good gymnastics and you train upper level things and you train that skill tree to get bigger you give yourself the opportunity to put those things in combination and put those things in routines right and so i mean is there i i don't know that there's necessarily a huge rush to get on the floor right yeah. like i mean uh, skill maturity comes through time repetition Right. And like them working through some of those inconsistencies. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, if you give kids more time to get that skill maturity before actually having to use them in competition, um, there's a, there's a heavy argument for that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. It was just but a brain, but, but I get it, but I get it. Yeah. I mean, I see both sides of the coin. I see, I definitely see the, you know, the reality that you can make all the rules and policies and regulations you want, but if some coaches are still going to choose to compete really hard skills and train them when they're young and pushed really aggressively too young, it doesn't matter where the age limits fall. And they've made that argument too with seniors and juniors, right? But I also see the other side, which is we know kids are not strength wise or power wise or maturity wise at their best when they're 12 pre puberty and asking them to be on the elite path or on the level nine, 10 path at such a young age might be setting them up for a lot of mental and physical um, collateral damage or junk mileage. And so I see both, uh, and that kind of idea, but the thought process is that maybe if we help guide people, you know, with some policies or a rule changes that maybe we do put on that pressure of valve release of, don't need to get a level, you know, a 12 year old level 10 or stuff like that. And that will then maybe hopefully say, okay, let's, let's train these skills. Like you said, on soft and find different ways to develop them. And that way, when you're on the other side of puberty and you're stronger and more fit, and you go through the changes that happen when you do grow, maybe when you're 14, 15, we can then start competing these skills, get the college radar going. And yeah, I just, it's really hard sometimes to have a conversation with, um, some high level gymnasts that I treat on the medical side when they're 11 and 12. And they're saying they want to compete, you know, your train goes in double backs and double pikes. And it's like, you got a storm coming for two years, man, when you go through puberty and all these skills kind of fall apart and your joints hurt really, really bad. You know, what's, what's the need to do these double backs on hard so early, so fast. And like we said, it comes down to a pride decision. It comes down to a, you know, is there a way we can get the best of both worlds of training these things and pursuing high level, but not putting so much, uh, extra, extra junk mileage on the athlete. So I don't know a good place well, to land for a conversation. Yeah. And there's a, I mean, there's a, a stressor there in the, the, the concept of, you know, that early bird gets the worm kind of thing. And, you know, the, uh, the college recruiting was getting pushed back down so low that they've tried to push that back up. Yep. Um, but certainly, um, you know, they still, uh, weigh in their decisions. Like, well, yeah, we've got a five-year history of this kid as a level 10, and we've got a one-year history of this kid as a level 10, right? And so you still, you've, if you get there early, you still give them a little bit more body of work to work off of as far as competitive history at level 10 and those kind of things too. And so, um, yeah, I there is pressure within the system to get there a little earlier, especially than it used to be, you know? Um, 
and uh as far as the jo stuff right yep. um elite is definitely we're trying to it's been pushing back the other way but it's kind of like both uh, they were going in different directions right yeah. like yeah. fig was trying to go later and like jo was getting earlier with the recruiting stuff so um i don't know i don't know how we settle on that perfect that perfect point but anyways yeah it's, it's definitely an interesting topic of conversation and i mean yeah um, we could, we could go on for hours more and more than this but i'm respectful of your yep. time i think this is a great definitely a conversation to kind of help people guide some of these, like we said, these gray areas, these tricky conversations that people in the trenches are having when, you know, media headlines say it's so easy to change these things, but in reality it's hard. And so um, I guess we'll just leave it at that, but are there any uh, other, other parting words you have or where people can find the proposal or where they can find stuff for Ascension Master? Cause you guys are putting out so much great content. I, I want people to definitely follow you guys. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. So Instagram at Ascend Gymnastics, we're just putting up a bunch of drills and different circuits and things like that, that, that hopefully I mean, we find helpful, that hopefully you guys can find helpful as well. Um, there's like a Facebook group that we kind of started not too long ago called Developmental Gymnastics. And it's a really good resource because there's a lot of good people on there and they're, they're, it's good stuff. People are posting yeah. really good, good, useful content. And it's things that have, uh, you know, I've, I've really taken stuff uh, from. Um, so that's really good. I would suggest going and, and, and clicking on that guy as well. Um, and then, um, yeah, as far as a place for the proposal, um, you know, I'm, I, I need to kind of get that up to a more widespread audience. Um, I'll send it to you. Yeah, and then, and, and maybe you can throw it up somewhere. Um, and then, um, yeah, I will also post, uh, you know, either a link to it on our Instagram or, um, or something like that. Um, I've shared it in some groups on Facebook before, but uh, I will share it on the developmental Facebook group as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, hopefully I, I can update you more as, as far as that goes, if, if we, uh, you know, can get it yep. up on a, on a universal, uh, yep. platform or something. You can definitely get a public Dropbox link out there or like a file sharing thing so someone can just like take it and check it out. Yeah, cool. All right, Brett, it sounds great. Thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, again, thanks for the early morning rise. <laughs> yeah, well, appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. Good conversation. Have a good one, man. Yeah, take care.